1977, September, Hollywood, California, the 12th floor, I think the place was called the Hyatt Continental. I want to go back and touch on my meeting with our brother. Because I'm, I'm saying this, that the way that went down proves the genuineness of the brother's motivation in doing what he has done. I've heard people, I haven't, no, they don't, not too many to my face, but I, there are people who have doubt about brother's motivation. And what's important about that is this. If he is improperly motivated, what you doing here? If he's improperly motivated, you're a hypocrite for staying with this circle. This is all about thinking tonight. That's all this is about. Think. It took me about eight days to get his phone number. I didn't know exactly where he was living. Then Allah blessed me to get it. And after a few, after some phone, couple of phone calls, we finally got together. He spoke first. We, we met in a restaurant and he spoke for a while. I'm watching him. I know what my intention is. He does not know what's in my mind. That's the first thing I want you to get clear on. I am watching him. We already had two conversations on the phone, and from some things he said, it was clear to me that there's certain things he just wasn't clear in his mind. For example, I raised the question on the phone. Where was Wallace in Scripture? He didn't know. He said he didn't know. And I think you have to acknowledge that, that that's an important question. It is an important question. If you step forth saying you're superior to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then you've got to be in the plan. And if you have been under that man and you don't know where that man is in the book, look, if you say you are following a man of God and you can't find that man of God in God's word, then that man who calls himself a man of God is obscure to you. And if the light comes through the man of God, and you are ignorant of the identity of the man of God or the man saying is the man of God in the book, then you yourself are in the dark. You cannot cast light without some of that light reflecting on yourself. Do you hear where I'm coming from? You got an argument with that? Okay, fine, we can move ahead. This is simple, I just want, but I just want to make it very clear what we're saying as we go along. There's no point in eating up everybody's time throughout the country on some, some jive talk or some guessing. And this has to be a meeting of substance. In fact, all our meetings have to be a meeting of substance. I don't mean to sound contentious, and I'm not, but I do know that we're not supporting our brother like we should. And we would support him better if we knew him better. And knowing him from the point of view of a Negro ain't going to get it. Or a half convert. We got to see it like it is. Look now. So he spoke for a few minutes. I could see that he didn't see the God, the messenger, the, the uh, several things like he used to see it. But there was such love expressed for Master Farad Muhammad, for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and for our people. The thought came in my mind, wow, he's just like a person under a thin sheet of ice. And in my mind, I said, this is going to be easy because I came ready to, to go to war with my brother. But the way he spoke about them, the love was there. And may I interrupt myself to say this. Weigh this wherever you are in your mind. When we as a group went to sleep in 75, if you went to sleep in love with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you come up in love with him. But if you went to sleep not digging him, you come up hating him. Well, that's the way it is. Go read John 10. You can find some of it in there. Now look. So then we went upstairs, and I had a book, and we put it on the shelf. He didn't know what was in it. He just knew it was something I had in the bag. I want to emphasize, this is very important for you to get this just the way it happened. Because it's in the book, too. Oh, yes, yeah, it's in the book. Ain't everything major is in the book. And we got to get some of the major stuff straight in our brain because we're about to run out the book. And the book ends on the judgment. And if we don't have our act together, we're going, we going to stay, we're going to burn, to, to make it short. Not somebody throwing you in a lake of fire physically and you burn for 10 billion years and never burn up. That would make the devil live as long as God. No, but we're, we're going to undergo a chastisement that if we understand it, then we don't want to go into that. And one of the reasons for brothers strain this past Sunday, if you understood what he was saying, 
was he don't want to see our people burn. Even those of our people who hate his guts. I hope it's plain. When I get through, I hope it's exceedingly clear. And I hope that to whatever extent we are in the study, we'll leave this with a greater desire to study than ever. Now look. So then we took a walk through the hills. He walked my feet off for about three hours. Three hours. I was tired, my feet. But as he was speaking, it was to me like a movie, like watching a movie. Because what I had tried to see some years before, I was hearing some details which I personally was not in a position to see. At the same time, I'm exploring his mind as he's talking. Then we go upstairs. Now here this brother is talking about wanting to rebuild the work, lift up the name of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and his head is not straight. Oh, that's what it is. We go upstairs and we talk for a while. After a point was exchanged concerning uh, the question of death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he moved to wanting to get into the things that were in his brain to rebuild the nation. This is, to me, very fascinating. You can't... Now, let's think about 1977 September. You think for a minute about trying to lift up the name of a man this government sought to snuff out. That Arabs sought to snuff out. That hypocrites and disbelievers sought to snuff out. That means what? The brother loves his wife and babies. It means that you might get killed. Don't ever say this brother did what he did for money. That's a stupid lie. It, it's nothing but a stupid lie, and it is not even worthy of intelligent discussion. You who say that, you're a hypocrite. And you're a damn fool. Now, why do I say that? You're not thinking at all. No man simply gets up before an old firing squad with your eyes open if you don't have to do it. But to get, to work on our people in the name of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad means you can get killed. Don't say his motive was money. Just say you don't know. Don't say it was money. The brother got talent. You know that. He could have done something else for some bucks. In this country, you can sell cocaine. The government will half back you up in that. There's a lot of things that brother could do for some money. Let's not be stupid. So dismiss that. If a person comes to you with that, say, wait a minute, brother. Wait a minute, sister. Look, I don't want to argue with you, but you obviously don't know. Be polite if the person is halfway polite. So you, you just don't know what you're talking about. Was you there back then? Do you know his motive? Where are you coming from? What is the basis of your statement? Hell, every one of us got to qualify our mouth to speak. Just because you say something don't make it so. That goes to me saying what I'm saying right now. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said once, it is not what the man says from his mouth, it's what you prove from your mouth that we should lay hold to. Okay, so he asked me a question about the rebuilding and I said I had nothing to say until after you've read that book. And then I left. And I came back later on that afternoon. And I could see he was being affected. He had got, I asked him how far he had gotten. And he had gotten through the third chapter. Well, I already knew what was in there. And I saw a look. And the look said, mm-hmm, he's being affected. I left. I didn't, I didn't want to stay or interfere with it because something was going on between him and his Lord. I want you to hear me out very carefully. And if you close your mind, may, I, may the Lord cook you. So that your mind opens up. Because you, you be sleeping on some important stuff here. Okay. I came back the next morning around 11 something. He was between the two beds. With the book out stretched out. Crying, tears running down his eyes. I got out of there. I had nothing to do with it. I wasn't the one working on it. You say, but you wrote the book. Hear me out. I know what I'm talking about. Listen very carefully. When I came back the next day, he had finished it except for the last little section, because that wasn't really another step. And he, he, was, he had his tie on, he was shaven, whatnot. 
and he was crying. And he was, you could, from, I'm telling you, I'm telling you now what I saw. You was not there. God was there. His apostle was there. And I was there. I was witnessing the resurrection of the dead. That's what I was looking at. I was, I was aware of the magnitude of what was going down up to a certain point, up to my capacity for sight at that time. He squeezed me so hard he hurt my rib on my right side. And he had, it was, he had a very pained expression on his face. And he stood back and he held one of my hands. He said, gee, that's the word he used. And with a pained expression, his head turned slightly to the side. I've been a hypocrite. Three days before, he was talking about rebuilding the work of a man who now he was saying with pain. He was a hypocrite too. I want you to weigh this. And then he asked me to join him in prayer. And he said this would be his first prayer in three years to Master Farad Muhammad. Not Allah spoke, but Allah man. Not Allah who can't answer, but who Allah who can answer. The Allah in the Quran who says, chapter 40, verse 60, Pray to me, I will answer you. There's more to that. There's what also led up to that. I want to touch a piece of it. Just a piece of it right now. <clears throat> that which he read came in answer to his yearning for a way to help uplift our people. Because he had seen the condition, especially of the former followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whose lives were now a wreck. That plus the people in general was tearing him up. This came in answer to his soul's yearning. But deeper than that, it came as a result of a prayer. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad prayed, for him years before. In 1968, in front of other people, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told our brother that he had been waiting on him for 38 years. And he identified him in front of others as the Aaron in the scripture. Don't argue with that because you wasn't there. Just say you wasn't there. If you say, that, if you say this, well, brother, I doubt that. I want to be convinced. Fine. But don't say it didn't happen because you wasn't there. There's a city called Phoenix, Arizona. It don't exist because you say it exists. It ain't got nothing to do with you. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Now, just as God provided Aaron from his strength, Brother Farrakhan was provided from the strength of God. Listen to me carefully. Moses asked for Aaron out of a sense of his own inadequacy. But did God provide Aaron out of his own inadequacy? No. The God chose his man and even got irritated according to the Bible over his man, Moses, expressing his inadequacy. He said, look, who made your mouth? As if to say, look, I know what I'm doing. I'm God. I got brains. I want to get the people up. Look, Moses, I wouldn't pick somebody that couldn't communicate my message clearly. I'm not stupid. Moses spoke to God out of his, this is the beginning of his mission. He ain't got it together yet. So out of his sense of weakness, he expresses help. But I ask you again, did God give Moses, Aaron, out of his weakness, no, out of the strength of his own foresight and out of his knowledge that one day Moses would have to come back to him for the next lesson. So what are the people going to do while Moses is gone? Just as God provided for Moses and the people, God provided for us for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and us. 
to even think that he was not thinking about and preparing for us during his absence is to say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not love us. It's to say he didn't have adequate foresight. It's to put him beneath the level of the average common father who loves his children and who has to leave them or who even might die. Don't, father, don't you have children? Aren't you concerned about their welfare? Suppose you had to leave them for a couple of years and you love the wife and you love the babies. Would you just walk off? Or would you make some provision for them during your absence? Do you think a man could work for 44 years working on so-called Negroes and not love us? To work with us to try to improve us? You got to love us to the max. You can't love us because we love you. You have to love us, us despite the fact that we don't dig you. Do you hear me?